So thank you for coming today and welcome to the second session of our lecture series on rule of law and democracy, which is part of a bigger lecture series on that's called the postdoctoral dialogues, norm plurality and critique. This particular lecture series is organized by Carlos Galvez Bermudez, Maria Emilia Barreiro and myself, Sophie Muller, who are all at normative orders. Today we'll have a talk by Professor Helene de Paul Studer, who is a professor of practical philosophy at the University of Vienna. She works on topics on rationality, practical reasoning, and normativity. She is the principal investigator of the ERC advanced grant project, the Normative and Moral Foundations of Group Agency, and the author of several books. Um, most importantly, today we'll be talking about part of her newest book, Justifying Injustice, Legal Theory in Nazi Germany, which came out in September last year, is that correct? Um, and she's also published uh, a book on Konrad Morgen, The Conscience of a Nazi Judge. So this is something that she's been working on. And she's also edited books on different topics, also on uh, the legal theory of national socialism and constructions of practical reason. The topic of her talk today is National Socialism and Constitutive Conditions of the Rule of Law. And now we have a link for the handout in the chat. So please go ahead, Professor Paul Studer. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind invitation to give a lecture. I'm really honored by the uh, invitation. And uh, uh, just a word on the Conrad Morgan book. This is a co-authored book with David Wellemann. I would like to uh, mention also my co-author because this book could not have been written by one person alone. Um, uh, today, as you see, I changed the title a little bit. I wanted to talk more abstractly about constitutive constitutive conditions of the rule of law, particularly on constitutivism. And I decided to do it more concretely based on the last book. Um, as the last week, uh, uh, the lecture by Professor Klaus Günther, it was really uh, very interesting because he talked about the difference between the rule of law and rule by law. And he also mentioned the different levels of the rule of law. And we have to keep uh, apart formal uh, moderate conditions of the rule of law, uh, conditions which speak to the form of legal norms. And we have to distinguish that from the larger picture of the rule of law, which is tied to uh, a political ideal uh, of justice, namely a specific political system, namely democracy. And today we will talk about when democracy is not in place. So in his uh, seminal article, Statutory Lawlessness and Supra-Statutory Law in 1946, Gustav Radbruch delivered a crushing verdict on legal positivism's role during Nazi rule. Um, Radbruch said, and this is quote, you have all the quotes on the handout. Positivism with its principle that a law is a law has in fact rendered the German legal profession defenseless against statutes that are arbitrary and criminal. And he added that positivism is not capable of justifying the validity of uh, statutes. And for Radbrook, legal positivism's main weakness consisted in this sharp separation of law and morality. Now, if we look at the Nazi legal thinkers' uh, texts, the original texts, then uh, uh, we see that Radbrook's argument does not really work. Indeed, National Socialist legal theorists firmly rejected legal positivism and they endorsed the unity of law and morality. And um, I have uh, on the handout uh, a, a few quotes and I would like to read to you those quotes. Uh, first of all, Lawrence, 
he blamed uh, Ke that Kelsen's poor theory of law was a, a quote, manifestation of intellectual foreign infiltration in German, eine geistige Überfremdung. There is an anti-Semitic connotation here because Kelsen was Jewish. Jewish. And Ernst Forsthoff blamed legal positivism of being responsible for the whole uh, ethical disorientation and relativism that had afflicted Germany during the Weimar period. Now, <clears throat> altogether, NS legal thinkers agreed that pos legal positivism's formalistic conception of law should be replaced by a material, a substantive understanding of law, particularly based on a unification of law and morality. And there's a striking quote by Georg Dahm. Georg Dahm was a criminal law expert. And uh, after a couple of years after the war, uh, which he spent in Pakistan, he could return to the University of Kiel um, and take up his professorship again. So what did Dam say? He said, we recognize today the independence and neutralization of law, the separation and opposition of law and state, law and politics, law and the people's intuition, Volksanschauung, law and morality as the core of this evil. Evil is here the positivism induced degeneration of law. And uh, to quote uh, Dam again, overcoming these antagonisms and creating unity within law is virtually a precondition for a true renewal of our legal life. Now, this topic or this uh, theme went through all the texts, right? I have a quote here from Roland Freisler, the notorious president of the People's Court. Qu quote Freisler, there can be no divide between a requirement of law and a requirement of morality. For requirements of law are requirements of decency, but what is decent is determined by the conscience of the folk and its members. And an expert on Nazi police law, the lawyer Walter Hamel, proclaimed that, quote, any distinction between a moral duty and a legal obligation for action can no longer be made. Now, as we know, legal positivism indeed endorses a strict separation on law and morality, for, of law and morality. And for legal positivists as Kelsen, morality sets external standards for assessing legal system and legal norms. And positivists from Bentham on argued that those external moral standards should motivate legal reform and the revision of statutes that generate unacceptable consequences. And uh, moral principles, they didn't exclude that they should guide a judge's legal decision-making in hard cases, particularly when positive law runs out. Now, there is a specific problem when it comes to Kelsen. We can talk about this in the Q&A, because Kelsen, that's really a problem. Uh, not the problem is not the separation of law and morality, but that he was a moral relativist. He was very much influenced by the meta-ethics of war by the verification uh, criterion uh, uh, the Vienna Circle put down, that only empirical judgments are meaningful. And uh, Kelsen really had a problem here with his relativism. So the relativism is the problem and his meta-ethics is the problem, but not the separation of morality and law as such. Now, in the view of the NS legal theories, moral ideas should form an in part of the law. They should be inside the law. And they are these NS lawyers, of course, had a concept of morality that was ideologically distorted. And consequently, they um, infiltrated ethical concepts such as decency, honor, loyalty into legal concepts, and those concepts had a specific ideological meaning. 
So let's look at uh, uh, Reinhard Höhn. Reinhard Höhn was a, a, a jurist and a member of the SS, and I think he was uh, he had a sort of management school in Bad Homburg after the war. Uh, he said. Uh, law is not simply a technique of applying independent ethical principles, rather law can only mean the lived morality or decency of a folk, the gelebte Sittlichkeit des Volks. And he said also, according to German legal doctrine, law is neither a system of norms nor a system of values. Law is the expression of the community order and justice can't be outside of the law. It must be in the law, right? And there's another quote by Otto Kohlreuter. <clears throat> he said, just as the political experience of folk and nation must be alive in each member of the folk in the folkish state, so must the folkish idea of law be alive in the sense of justice of each Volksgenosse. And this means above all that each member of the folk recognizes all other members as legal comrades and that the personality and honor of each Volksgenosse is an inviolable legal good. They talked of legal goods, but of course the concept of right was gone. Why was the concept of right gone? Because they argued, look, the national socialist state is a state built on unity and we don't need an antagonism between the Volksgenossen, yeah, there were no individuals uh, in the strict sense anymore. Uh, the members of the folk community and the Führer, there is no antagonism. The concept of right, they argued, is an outdated uh, notion uh, from the 19th century when there was really an antagonism between the people and the sovereign. Right? It was it's an interesting argument, right, because it gives also a description of their conception of the Führer sovereignty. Now, what can we, what can, should we make of this, right? Uh, uh, and I think, you know, um, uh, what we, what we have to see here is uh, the political con con context, right? Uh, what what uh, what implications uh, does this endorsement of the unification of law and morality by Nazi jurists have? Uh, my argument will be: we need the separation of law and morality, and I would like to provide a normative reason why we need it. And my argument is simply: let's look back to Kant. And then we see why we need the separ separation of law and morality. Just a, a word here, um, uh, a clarification, a conceptual one. I talk here all the time of law and morality, but of course morality has different meanings. And what I mean by morality is assumes ethics, individual personal ethics, it, but it also covers public morality, principles of justice, and from that, I would like then to distinguish law. So we have three normative spheres, individual ethics, uh, public morality, morality in the form of principles of justice, public morality to speaks to the framework of institutions, how we uh, uh, see institutions, how we build institutions, and law as a separate normative sphere. Now, let's look um, uh, 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 at the political context of this unification of law and morality in NS legal theory. As we know, the Third Reich was a totalitarian state striving for complete control over its citizens. And a core feature of such a form of political authoritarianism is a comprehensive value system. Better said, it's they aim uh, at a comprehensive value system, one that aims to regulate all aspects of life. So we can see that the normative ambitions of national socialism, and I talk here about the ideology, right? 
uh, involved what John Rawls has called a fully comprehensive moral and political doctrine that is a normative order that, quote, uh, I quote here uh, Rawls, covers all recognized values and virtues within one rather precisely articulated system, end of quote. So a fully comprehensive co doctrine is, as uh, Rawls said, quote, unreasonable insofar as it makes a fundamentalist claim to absolute truth. The state's view of what is true and good is beyond criticism. And Rawls added, uh, quote, the religiously true or the philosophically true overrides the politically reasonable. Now, all this, of course, uh, is in uh, contrast sharply with a liberal democratic political system in which the state has to be constitutively neutral toward, towards personal values, convictions, religious convictions, worldviews. In the democratic state, citizens are free to pursue their individual conception of a well-lived life within an established framework of rights. And there is no need for the state to intervene and constrict personal values as long as those value commitments respect the rights and equal freedom of others. And it's precisely that principle of tolerance that is, is discarded when a state moves to authoritarianism or then totalitarianism. Individual freedom there succumbs to an all-encompassing normative ideological order. So, uh, what we have to see is that this unification of law and morality by NS legal theorists was a strategy. It was a strategy to expand the state's sphere of action, namely in eliminating the difference between legal and ethical norms, recall of Reisler's quote, yeah, the NS state's authority encompassed not only the sphere of outer freedom, but also of inner freedom, that is of personal ethical values, convictions, attitudes, and so on. And the, here we can see that the state now entered a normative territory that is foreclosed to it in a democratic system. And when we look back at Immanuel Kant, then we see exactly uh, what's at stake here, right? because um, uh, Kant sharply distinguished law from ethics, and he did this also to outline the limits of state authority. For Kant, the state had to regulate room, human relationships in outer space in the sphere of external freedom. And he argued, although the state might require citizens to obey the uh, norms and statutes of the state, necessarily, if necessary, even by means of force. The motives individuals have to comply with the state's legal norms are according to enlightenment philosophy, not the state's business. The domain of inner freedom, that is the sphere of ethical dispositions, motives, this is subject of self-legislation not state legislation. Um, so the major differences in Kant between Kant's ethics and his philosophy of right uh, reside particularly in the roles played by motivation and coercion. So as we know in Kant's ethics, we have a very close connection between motivation and normativity. The point of his ethical philosophy is the principle of the, to reveal the principle of a good will, and this is the categorical imperative, right? And acting morally or ethically is to act out of respect for the moral law, and that means out, act, to act out of duty. So the morally good person makes the moral law, the categorical imperative, we can talk about um, I would say in the first two versions, the formula of universal law, formula of humanity, her or his principle of action by acting only on maxims that can be thought or willed as a universal law or maxims which don't might violate uh, the dignity of others. 
And things work differently in the sphere of right. For Kant, it is crucial that people follow laws and statutes, that in the ideal case, conform with the principle of right, which requires to respect the equal freedom of others. However, the motivational reasons why individuals comply with laws are legally irrelevant. Autoconformity is sufficient for the fulfillment of juridical obligations. You have on the handout the uh, quote here from the Metaphysics of Morals, the introduction to the philosophy of right, where he talks about the two kinds of law giving, right? In the one case, the incentive in ethics, the incentive is crucial in uh, ex philosophy of right, external freedom, uh, the incentive doesn't matter, right? But regulating the outer relations of freedom, this requires, as Kant clearly, clearly saw, enforcement. That these persons have to be prevented, if necessary, by force from violating others' bodily external, bodily integrity and also their external space. And according to Kant, the principle of equal freedom as the guiding norm of the uh, public sphere entails that citizens have rights whose justifi protection justifies coercion, right? And he talks here of a condition of mutual, uh, uh, rightful mutual relations and public rightfulness requires that coercion is exercised, but it can't be exercised by other individuals, right? By our, our fellow uh, 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 citizens. It can only be uh, uh, exercised by proper public institutions, the state. So Kant provides to sum up a careful justification of why we may not confound ethics and law. And I think this is the crucial argument for keeping ethics and law apart and morality and law apart in this way, right? So it is a respect for personal and public autonomy that requires to separate these normative spheres. Other than ethics, which is directed at an agent's inner freedom, law should preserve an agent's external freedom. Now, the preceding philosophical, this philosophical digression allows us to perceive the really how terrible the role of the moralization of law in NS legal theory was, right? Because the attempt to eliminate any distinction between morality read it here in the sense of ethics, individual ethics and law, this strengthens the regime's power. An attitude of inner commitment and loyalty served the goals of the Führer state more than mere obedience of the laws. And historians like Hans Mommsen have argued that this ethical acceptance of Führer orders was fundamental for the inner stability of the Third Reich in the first years. Momsen argues that without uh, these ethical convictions of the bureaucracy, of the administration and so on, the Third Reich would hardly have made it until 1939. Now, let's move to conditions of the rule of law. As said, I have defended a core assumption of legal positivism, the separation for, from law, uh, of law from morality. And this defense rested on a normative argument, namely that to keep the spheres here apart is crucial for preserving individuals' autonomy. Yet one might further question whether the dreadful experience with, with Nazi law, do they not compel us to be a little bit more careful here? Do they not compel us to, to say a bit more about the connection between law and morality as just claiming them to be distinct normative spheres? Does it not this terrible misuse of law in the Third Reich make us think more deeply about the role of justice in an appropriate legal system? Uh, indeed, 
I think. The separability thesis, as it was defended by uh, Kelsen, that, that alone doesn't work anymore. And I have here a quote from Hans Kelsen from his English edition of his Pure Theory of Law, der Reinen Rechtslehre. And in 1967, Kelsen said the following, the legal quote, the legal order of totalitarian states authorizes their governments to confine in concentration camps persons whose opinions, religions or race they do not like, to force them to perform any kind of labor, labor even to kill them. And he says, why such measures may be violently condemned from a moral standpoint, they cannot be considered as taking place outside the legal order of these states. Well, that's true, but he didn't say more and he never had more to say about the Nazi legal system, except that it was positive law. Uh, we know it had authority and it had force and it terrified many. And this is exactly because it was tied to terror of historically, of an historically un, uh, uh, unprecedented, on a historically unprecedented scale, that I think we are forced to say a little bit more, right, then. Similarly, Hart maintained that, quote, it is in no sense a necessary truth that laws reproduce or satisfy certain demands of morality, though in fact they often have done so, right? And I think we have to say more that merely that the NS legal system was morally a bad system. So opponents of legal positivism, and uh, 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 I would like to uh, quote here David Dysonhaus, they urge us to reflect on the legal failures also of Nazi law. And David House, Dysonhaus uh, reminds us that he said something, quote, goes wrong here, not only morally speaking, but also legally speaking. And I think this is correct. So in other uh, words, uh, uh, NS law displayed grave structural deficiencies failures connected to the regime's worst crimes. Apart from politically motivated retroactive le legislation, the greatest damage was done by the secretive nature of Führer orders, both verbal Führer orders and in the form of letters. For example, there was no uh, written order, let alone a legal statute for the murder of Jews and for the whole extermination program. It was handed on orally by oral orders. And the so-called legal foundation of the National Socialist Euthanasia Program, which claimed an estimated 7,000 victims, some assume more than 100,000 victims, was an informal letter from Hitler to the head of the Führer Chancellery, Philipp Buhler, and to his personal physician, Karl Brandt. Uh, the letter dated September 1st, 1939, empowered the, them to inform, as it was called, selected physicians that, quote, and this is the writing in the letter, in all probability, incurably ill people may be granted mercy death after the most scrupulous judgment of their state of illness. This was a letter, right? And it was the so-called legal basis for the euthanasia program. Now, the Nazi racial laws, the so-called Nuremberg laws, enacted on September 15, 1935, they were officially published in the Reichsgesetzblatt. But the regime did not dare to issue orders for euthanasia or the extermination of the Jews and other ethnic groups such as Roma and Sinti in the form of a legal uh, uh, statute, let alone to publicize those measures in the Reichsgesetzblatt. So what do we see here? Secrecy, we see, is one of the main instruments of a totalitarian state exercise of power and of, uh, of its political criminality. And the mere requirement to promulgate Führer orders, to publish them 
I think would have prevented the worst, worst excesses of uh, the Nazi regime. So we can generalize here the argument. We can say a legal system that recognizes and aims to meet moderate normative conditions, such as publicity, transparency, understandability, reliability, predictability, consistency of norms, legal norms, and a, a regime that avoids arbitrary legis legislation and arbitrary retroactive legislation, such a regime does not lend itself to totalitarian power. So at the purely legal level, at the level of, we might say, very basic formal conditions of the rule of law, the horrendous crimes of the Third Reich seem impossible. Now, let's turn a little bit back to the legal philosophers discussion. These normative conditions, which I mentioned here, right, I repeat them, publicity, transparency, understandability, re reliability, consistency, and so on. These are basically exactly those uh, normative principles that Lon Fuller developed in his story of the well-meaning sovereign Rex, who confused citizens with exactly with his erratic legislation, right? And Fuller suggested that legal rules and norms should be general and made known to the affected subjects. Moreover, they should be prospective rather than retroactive, clear, understandable, free from contradictions. In short, legal rules and norms should not require that from citizens which is impossible. And they also should not be constantly changed there should also be congruence between enacted law and official actions, right? And citizens should know what they have to expect from the state. Now, here is the problem. Fuller called those principles, which defined a proper form of legislation, he called it the inner morality of law. He did this in the book, The Morality of Law, uh, uh, and the, uh, the revised edition came out in 1969, the first, I think, in 1964. Now, Fuller's terminology here, his understanding of the outline principles, last, the, uh, uh, namely as inner morality of law, blurs again the line between law and morality in ways which I think problematic. He came by talking of the inner morality of law close to this unification of law and morality, which is troubling, right? Now, Fuller's conditions for appropriate legal systems, these conditions of publicity, transparency, understandability, and so on, they are neither full-fledged moral principles, nor are they really inner elements of the law. Rather, and this is my uh, uh, position, rather I think we should read them as constitutive normative requirements that stand between law and morality. And I talk here morality in a broad sense, yeah? As neither legal nor moral principles, they are best seen as constitutive conditions of a legal system that does not openly violate the rule of law. And these conditions, the quoted uh, uh, conditions, result, I think, from translating moral insights, insights about the consequences of law in the hands of erratic, let alone tyrannical sovereigns, into normative requirements of a legal system that can then comply with the rule of law. And such a legal order might come closer to the ideal of a morally proper legal systems. So requirements of the rule of law, I think, link law and morality, but they do not erase the distinction between the two, those two normative spheres, namely the one regulating inner freedom, the other one regulating outer freedom 
a regulation that's tied to the coercive power of the state. Now, can I say a bit more, how should we understand it? I think instead of striving for an inner unity of moral law and morality that might be open to ideology driven moralization, it is indeed the way to go is indeed to convert available moral insights about the malfunctioning of legal systems into normative requirements that can function as constitutive conditions of at least, at least a formally intact legal system, uh, a, a legal system where the legal norms meet certain formal conditions of the rule of law. And such insights can be gained by reflecting on the likely consequences when law serves an authoritarian or totalitarian regime to control and suppress citizens. Now, Fuller's narrative of Rex is really illustrative, but I think, you know, it's even better to have real world historical cases. And my argument is let's look clearly on the Nazi legal system, also what the legal theorists there said, and we can really see how law can turn into a mere instrument of political ideology. Now to come back to the philosophical uh, discussion. As we know, Fuller paid dearly for reading those principles as the inner morality of law. He got a devastating critique from Hart. Uh, uh, and I think this is historically a little, it's unjust because Fuller had an accurate understanding of what went wrong in the Nazi legal system. And he understood the Nazi legal system much better. He had much better knowledge than Hart, right? So Fuller's theoretical contribution were not well received. And Hart, for whom the separation thesis was, of course, indispensable, argued that, I quote here, Hart from a review he wrote on Fuller's book, he said, quote, the classification of Fuller's principles as a form of morality, this just breeds confusion, end of quote. And Hart reduced Fuller's requirements to mere instrumental uh, rules to rules of efficiency. And he said, uh, uh, they, these principles, which Fuller here mentions, uh, publicity and so on, right, uh, are just necessary, quote, heart, for the efficient execution of the purpose of guiding human conduct by rules, end of quote. I think Hart's critical reading of Fuller's condition simply misjudged their normative significant, significance. They, were, they are not merely instrumental rules of efficiency. They have normative power. And uh, this normative power and significance uh, becomes apparent as soon as we consider them as condition, constitutive conditions of a rule of law system, uh, namely a legal system oriented toward agents' autonomy. Now, the Nazi legal system amounted, as we know, to a purely hierarchical exercise of force, right? It was not merely about control, it used brutal terror on its subjects in the pro, uh, pro process, right? And a legal system that respects agents' inner and outer freedom is structured differently, right? Uh, uh, it really respects uh, 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 a citizens' autonomy and it also uh, considers law as a social practice that seeks to protect agents' autonomy. How? By setting regulative rules for coordination, cooperation, and conflict solving, thus normatively uh, structuring relations between subjects. Law in this sense embodies the means to create also regulative rules of social interaction.
Now, let me uh, end here with some uh, concluding remarks. So what conclusions should we draw? Now, one result of our look at the Nazi legal theorists is certainly that the distortions of Nazi law pose a challenge to legal philosophy that really requires us to move beyond the old dispute between legal positivism and natural law theory. As I have quoted one so-called natural law theorist, David Geisenhaus, he, he told us, look, there was something going wrong legally. And legal positivism tells us, look, we have to take the separation of law and morality seriously. Now, at first sight, it may appear, you know, if you look at it from the old, in terms of the old debate, legal positivism, but natural law, it first appears that the NS jurist's understanding of law uh, aligned with natural law theory. Proponents of a natural law position have always strongly defended the tight connection between law and morality. And they have vigorously argued that justice and morality should be part of law. All this, of course, was shared by NS theorists. But of course, you know, natural law theorists were and are far, far from promulgating a conception of law that could turn it into a mere means of a totalitarian regime. When natural lawyers stressed the significance of this connection between law and morality, they did so precisely to prevent an ideological abu abuse of law. And this was also driving uh, uh, Gustav Radbruch. However, as our discussion sought to show, all attempts at diminishing, let alone erasing the line between morality, ethics and law should be met with skepticism, if not outright rejection, since they fail to recognize that separating these normative spheres is crucial, crucial for uh, uh, securing agencies' freedom. Since ethics and law, morality and law, have different regulatory tasks, they also fo follow different normative principles. And we can see this clearly in Kant's system of practical philosophy. The ethical categorical imperatives, uh, they are there that we uh, to check on our maxims, the subjective principles of our action. The universal principle of right, stressing the equal freedom of all of us in the, in the sphere of external freedom, this is there to regulate our uh, relations in outer space. Now, Radcliffe's post-war critic of legal positivism has uh, often been interpreted as a victory of natural law over legal positivism. And this is simply implausible. Positivism is right that wicked legal systems still preserve their authority, their statute remain legally valid within the systems and they exercise force, like it or not. Here, Kelsen is right. But natural law theorists are also right to remind us that there is more to say about the connections between justice, morality, and law than just saying that uh, a law may be morally bad. Now, <clears throat> what follows from this uh, moralization of law in national socialism. I would like to close with a word on this. What is implied by the fact that the NS theorician, the uh, uh, legal theorist endorsed such a synthesis, a unity of law and morality? One might say, well, nothing special follows, right? They just had the wrong form of morality, right? They did, their moralization of law rested on a, not on a correct or true morality, but an ideologically distorted one. But the problem here is that morality um, uh, does not always, um, or societies do not always have in view what moral philosophers so arrogantly call the true morality that is clearly recognizable and a priori detectable moral principles. Morality 
uh, cannot be limited to a few purely abstract formulas and rules determined to be a priori true. Moral truth, if we want to speak of moral truth at all, right, um, require that their meaning be interpreted and spelled out and fleshed out in social practices. And in a context like the Nazi state, it is, was precisely at this level how these abstract concepts were uh, spelled out, where the distortion, indeed the perversion of the morality uh, took place, right? Why? Because the NS regime used terms, right? Decency, honor, virtue, and so on. They used the same terms as we use in a non-distorted, non-ideologized uh, 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 use of morality. And they had their own interpretation of moral principles, rules, and virtues. In particularly, ideology-driven organizations in the, of the NS state, for example, the SS, this was through and through a moralized uh, discourse, a perverted morality, right? Himmler had his own reading of virtues of honesty, truthfulness, of bravery, loyalty, courage, uh, manliness, whatever he meant, right? Sanctity of property, rules of manly discipline, officers' discipline, and so on. They were all understood and implemented politically. Now, we should keep in mind what law is for. Law should be a means for coping with social and moral conflicts, but law should not itself become a crushing moral problem. And the ideological misuse of morality in the Nazi legal system suggests that morality might best fulfill its role as a critical standard for assessing a legal system, then it acts also as a source for defining constitutive conditions of the rule of law or when those conditions are in place, right? And compliance with the requirements of the rule of law then defines an intact legal order. Thank you. Thank you very much for this thought-provoking lectures. Now, before we go to the general Q&A, we have two comments. Uh, the first comment is by Professor George Pavlakos, who's Professor of Law and Philosophy at the School of Yo Law, University of Glasgow. His published work includes the book, Our Knowledge of the Law from 2007. He's recently edited Reasons and Intentions in Law and Practical Agency. And he's the general editor of the book series Law and Practical Reason and the joint general editor of the journal Jurisprudence. So please go ahead. You have around 10 minutes for your comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. And thank you, Herlinde. And uh, a big thanks to everyone in Frankfurt for this invitation. Um, so I relied um, uh, mostly on the on the chapter that Herlinde um, pre-circulated. Um, her talk was um, uh, sufficiently close to that. She added some um, uh, important elements, uh, but um, in the discussion, we can come back to these. Um, I should say that I enjoyed enormously um, having this paper. And what I admire is this way of um, making um, complex things sound effortless. Um, so um, this is something I admire, even though um, I think I'm going to work in the opposite direction, Herlinde. I'm going to complicate things again <laughs> a little bit more. Um, so, um, uh, so look, I think what is important in in this uh, endeavor is um, this uh, challenge of the received idea that, um, uh, which is a controversial uh, claim of Herlinde's and interesting claim um, uh, of challenging the idea that attributes the injustices of Nazi law to a sharp separation of law and morality. I think this is um, a, a very nice way to motivate um, uh, the chapter and more broadly the book and your um, project more generally. Um, instead, you propose a view that a constitutivist account that tries to uh, bring together elements from uh, positivism, as you told us, and um, uh, some non-positivist, if I may call it, uh, elements. I mean, you call them 
um, uh, constitutive elements, um, constitutive normative ideas which relate to the aims of a legal system. And in this way, these principles can explain what is legally wrong. I think this is important because obviously um, this is a dialectical point uh, in favor of the non-positivist that, that we need to explain the legal wrong of, of uh, an unjust legal system, not just um, eva evaluate it externally and um, uh, morally speaking. Um, and you do that without resorting to some creative gerrymandering that we see often with um, non-positivist uh, legal philosophers. So uh, what I mean here is this effort, for instance, Dworkin at some point, but also I think Alexi and others have tried to, to undertake a taxonomical project. You know, so here is Nazi legal law. Some parts of it were valid, some others were not valid uh, because of this, because of that. I think um, th there is something um, to... Um, to recommend against going down that path, and maybe your account fares better as as I um, as I thought. So I'm going to raise two points. First, the chapter's argument um, hinges on the premise that for any legal system to be a rule of law, it must respect the separation of law and morality. So I think I want to explore an implication of this claim, and I I worry that you might commit to a stronger claim, namely a claim that any non-positivist position. Uh, must oppose the rule of law uh, in virtue of its rejection of the separation thesis. And you come close to that when you say, well, it was a mistake of Fuller's to call his account the morality of law, because any account that tries to, uh, to go beyond the distinction has, um, uh, is, is to be, we, we should be cautious um, uh, about it. And the second point I want to uh, bring out is a little bit probably more technical. I want to see how the constitutive strategy uh, of Herlinde, um, how it might clash um, with the positivist um, position of uh, the separation of law and morality. So I remind you, she wants to keep both. She wants to keep the separation thesis plus adds, you know, the, and I think they are in conflict or intention. Let's say intention to be more um, neutral. So the first point. Um, so Herlinde's account rests on the argument that non-positivist accounts violate autonomy in virtue of their rejection of the separation thesis. Is her rejection of non-positivism as normatively uh, flawed overstated? The argument draws on Kant's legal and political philosophy. Kant's distinction between law and morality is reflected in the distinction of two kinds of freedom. On the one hand, freedom as autonomy, and on the other, freedom as independence. Law is about independence and morality is about autonomy. To that extent, in the Kantian system, it would constitute a violation of autonomy if a legal organization were to enforce on its subjects um, um, standards of autonomy, as uh, she aptly uh, illustrated. This was the fallacy of NS uh, law, but it would be too quick to argue that any variant of non-positivism would commit the same uh, fallacy. I think we need to be a little bit more fine-grained when we apply this Kantian distinction within the context of non-positivism more generally. Um, and my point is here that I want to, to cordon off a little bit some parts of non-positivism, not, not that her criticism sort of permeates everything, and, and that, I think, uh, is not possible. So let me demonstrate my point briefly. There are some non-positivisms, I will call them naive, um, um, uh, I would not commit that to paper, but let's call them naive for the sake of this discussion, um, which might indeed violate the Kantian constraint, even though they are clearly not wicked. So not NS law, not um, uh, national socialism. Thomist legal theory or some other perfectionism might be an example of that kind, um, of this type of legal theory I'm talking about. So. They pick out values for the flourishing of individual agency and enforce them in the public domain. Um, that um, um, that uh, would violate the Kantian constraint, despite purporting to enforce good standards, to put it in this way. However, there are other instances of non-positivism, let's call them sophisticated, which by morality purport to refer specifically to principles similar to Kantian independence. Now, I think I think something that like Dworkin's political morality, um, broadly conceived, 
um, or the public, the idea of public reason in roles, or you know, the principles of justice in roles. Um, maybe um, Habermas's um, parts of Habermas's account, uh, the democratic principle, or uh, even some parts of um, Alexis's account in the earlier um, uh, writings. Um, would would be this type of sophisticated non-positivism. These versions rely on moral standards that are relational and to that extent cannot be legislated autonomously. But nothing precludes them from being moral. They represent a distinct layer of morality which contains reasons which are public as opposed to being private or personal. Sophisticated non-positivism in fact can and this is a little bit of a now of a positive thesis. Non, this sophisticated non-positivism, in fact, can and should accept the separation of law and morality, without requiring that law is exclusively the product of social facts. Rather, and I think this is how we should read Kant. And I'm saying this in all knowledge that I am among um, I am much more sophisticated Kantians than myself. Um, that the separation is of relevant that the separation that is of relevance here is among two normative spheres, as Herlinde has told us: the sphere of independence, the morality of right, and the sphere of autonomy, the morality stricto sensu, um, or narrow morality. No sooner, however, has this clarification been added than any notion of legal validity resting on purely social sources becomes untenable, in my view. The separation of independence from autonomy suggests that the determinants of legal obligations must involve uh, some evaluative uh, normative facts, uh, albeit ones of ind independence, not autonomy. The second now worry, the worry about the tension between the constitutive account and the clash with positivism. Upholding the positivist uh, separation thesis limits decisively the relevance of morality. At most, it can play the role of an exposed filter for the moral evaluation of legal systems, which have been already uh, ex ante uh, constituted. So law is there on independent criteria, and then morality comes to evaluate it as a, as a filter, as it were. But this strategy comes too late, as Herlinde admits. One needs to account for the legal defects of unjust law. The strategy she proposes aims to show that law can be evaluated from within, hence the constitutive uh, strategy. This is an insightful strategy that reaps the fruits of moral evaluation without giving up the separation of law and morality. At the same time, it goes beyond a mere external evaluation of law through a moral filter by identifying evaluative standards which are constitutive elements of legal systems. Here are a couple of concerns. One, very briefly, I think the strategy might be at risk of begging the question in favor of good instances of law. So if the constitutive con conditions are inferred from successful instances of law, of the rule of law, then it does not come as, as a surprise that any, any malfunctioning legal system would violate them. So I will leave this a charge of circularity a little bit um, aside um, and move on to the second point. Um, relatedly, there is a deeper concern about the role and the purpose of the constitutive strategy. If the relevant evaluative um, non-moral standards were genuinely constitutive, the way I understand constitution or um, const constitutive uh, determination one would expect any legal system that violates them to fail to materialize. So in that sense, but Herlinde's account insists on the social sources of legal validity, however morally flawed a legal system may be. Can she uphold both? Both the constitutive strategy and the positivist source-based account. My worry is that each of these accounts purports to explain how legal facts obtain but in a manner that antagonizes the other. So they lie on the same level, so they, they try to do the same thing, but they do it, you know, in a manner that... Um, to appreciate the challenge, it might help to relate the discussion to contemporary uh, non-positivist theories, 
which deploy metaphysical argument to explain how facts how legal facts obtain. The challenge they purport to highlight for positivism is not so much that it cannot filter out immoral law, but rather that it cannot explain how the content of the law obtains in the first place. The thrust of the argument is that social practices cannot determine their own relevance to the content of the law unless further elements are added. As the argument goes, there are multiple possible mappings from the more basic social facts to the legal um, um, facts, to the content of the law. The result being that what we know about the facts at the base, the social facts, the more fundamental, cannot settle which of the alternative mappings uh, from a set of social facts to um, possible meanings is actual. So there are many possible mappings um, and we do not know um, which one is the actual. This in indeterminacy is then used as a reductio uh, of the positivist uh, notion of validity. Conversely, these views propose uh, in order to counter the inde indeterminacy, um, we should add substantive moral principles which constrain the multiple possible uh, mappings. And then we know, you know, how, how the social facts how they relate to the content of the law. Um, to cut this story short, it seems to me that any constitutivist argument like Herlinde's that involves evaluative facts disables and supersedes the positive notion of validity, precisely because the positivist notion is constructed um, uh, on a par of other views that explain the constitution uh, of the law. In the state of social validity, a modified notion of validity needs to, to step in, which explains the obtaining of legal facts as involving both social and evaluative constituents. Here, the constituents of legal facts are not automatically reflected in the legal uh, facts, but the latter, the legal facts, need to be worked out from their constituents. Now, I will try with an example to demonstrate to you uh, how this way of thinking about the law um, is um, more conducive, I think, for a position, um, uh, you know, pays, has a higher, a better pay off for a non-positivist position. With an example, um, on the account I'm proposing, um, uh, let me see, uh, let's take this example. Suppose an authoritative ordinance proclaims Greek people should be banned from the streets. They just they do away with Greeks. I mean, you know, lock them up. And on the account we are discussing now, the one I'm proposing, the linguistic meaning of the ordinance or any other social fact, uh, the linguistic meaning of Greek people should be banned from the streets, does not become automatically the content of the law. The linguistic meaning is merely a datum whose relevance to the content of the law is determined by substantive principles of political morality or independence, uh, or I think most of the stuff that Herlinde calls um, uh, fundamental evaluations or constitutive evaluations. Assuming, um, and assuming that among those principles, you will find something about justice, which I think we agree uh, on that with uh, Herlinde, then the constituted legal fact from this particular um, uh, sentence that I uh, mentioned, this particular uh, command about Greeks, the constituted legal fact would probably be a legal obligation not to ban Greeks from the streets. So, you know, it would be a, like an a contrario, uh, if you want, um, um, uh, result. To round up my uh, comment, and I hope I haven't abused your time. Uh, I think we have nothing to gain from retaining the positivist notion of validity, especially when we seek to explain law's existence uh, via its normative aims and evaluations. It seems to me that any lingering pull or appeal which the notion of positivist validity might exert on us is down to our reluctance to collapse the distinction between law and morality. But do we really need 
positivist validity in order to uphold the difference between these two normative spheres. Remember what we said earlier, in a non-positivist Kantian fashion, the said separation is one not between facts and norms, but one about two different spheres of normative standards, those of independence and those of autonomy. Keeping them separate, keeping these separate does not require the positivist notion of validity. It might even instruct us to abolish it, or so I tried to argue. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. If it's okay with you, Professor Paul Stude, you'll get a chance to reply after the two comments. Um, and now we have the second commentator is also the co-organizer of this series, Carlos Galvez Bermudez, who is a, a doctoral fellow at the Research Center on Normative Orders in Frankfurt. He has an LLB in law from Rosario University in Colombia and an LLM in legal theory from the Goethe University Frankfurt. He is currently a doctoral candidate in legal philosophy under the supervision of Professor Klaus Günther, who was our speaker last week. Uh, and his main interest is on the intersection of philosophy of law and political theory. And he works on theories of practical reason, authority of law and democratic legitimacy. Please, Carlos. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks to everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor published today for this inter interesting lecture uh, that develops many, many, many really intriguing points. Uh, as Professor Paulakos mentioned before, I, I will take a similar, similar way. I I'm going to comment more or less, especially on the paper that you sent us and complement a little bit with uh, this lecture that I have the impression that adds many points that are complementary but that were not too explicit at least i couldn't see it too explicit on the on the paper uh, also i try to to focus because the abstract and, and everything that you sent us before more on the constitutivist and all the theoretical part there but uh, going now to to my points that are i expect quite short uh, I have to admit that uh, that my uh, that the text had so many points, but I want to start with one about legal systems and rule of law. My first point is related how to transit from the moral positive critique of the Nazi legal, uh, legal system to the normative positive approach of the rule of law. I find that all the historical points that you show are to attack and show the problematics of the ideological issues of a concept of law, but not the ideological issues of a moral aim of the rule of law. You are attacking somehow in the first part, the concept of law and not the concept of the rule of law. And then, to develop an idea that it is necessary that the rule of law fulfill the problems that you saw on the concept of law. So I have the impression that there are two different things there. And so, but I, I will try to develop a little bit further this idea. So Professor Powers Tudor makes a defense against the moralization of law. She shows how the moralization of law was used in the Nazi regime in order to round the very basis of the concept of law. That means of law as such. From that point of view, she shows that law should not be used in a moralized way. It is desirable that law is not founded in morality and doesn't work in a moralized way. Let's say that she claims a normative positivist position on the foundations of law. However, I have the impression that here there is a jump between two different concepts in order to defend the next premise, which is that because law should not be found in moralization, the ideal of how law should work not be moral neither. As far as Professor Paul Studer defends the idea that a legal system could be a legal system, even if it doesn't comply and doesn't aim to comply to the rule of law, I understand that 
in the later steps, she defends that rule of law and legal system are not the same thing. So I think there is something missing in, in the construction. How not just moralized law could be dangerous, but also how moralized ideal could be also dangerous. The object of her critiques could be not the moralized concept of law, but the moralized of the ideal of well-working system. If that is true, should not be more useful also to add that the premise that she rejects and from where she starts is how a moralized rule of law works with a, even with a non-moralized legal system and why it is necessary to get a non-moral foundations of the ideal of rule of law in order to avoid that consequence. A legal positivism can accept that the rule of law is a moral idea, but it could say, they can say that it doesn't affect at all how law is rounded. Because the idea is the aspiration, how it should be, and not the foundational requirements to be the law. So my, my second point is I have some thoughts about uh, what this construction can bring us in the legal practice and what it is for. Somehow the normative foundations of the rule of law wants to avoid the disaster of agency annulation happened with the moralized legal order that Professor Powers Studer uh, explains, but how it works and what main difference can produce. Well, functioning is not a matter of validity, as Professor Studer uh, Powers Studer uh, defends, and not a matter of legitimacy, but it looks that is also not a matter of utility. It is a matter of constitution, of what is the good performance of the practice and how to show how the practice is and dismiss what is not the practice. But does that conceptual, a constitutive conceptual concept bring us to the conclusion that every not rule of law legal system is still being a legal system? I think not. And that brings me to the third, to, to, to the, four, uh, the third point. That is, I think uh, the interesting idea of bringing this rule of law standards as a normative standards and not making dependent on external sources sounds really interesting, but I have the idea that it could, this constitutivism can bring something else if it's possible to do the connection between the rule of law and the legal system. So how a constitutionalist could bring this together, not just saying that a legal system exists even if the rule of law is not there, and that the rule of law constitute by normative standards that are normative, but to say that every legal system needs a rule of law. Can really the constitutivism uh, help us to answer these questions? Uh, and that's how I try to, to read this proposal. And I think, yes, and I think it brings us to the different place to say that the legal system that doesn't fulfill these conditions is not a legal system based not in external sources, but based in these normative constituent requirements that Professor Studer had developed. And this helped also to fulfill the problem that Professor Power Studer tried to fix in Long Fuller to say that there are two points on Long Fuller in one side that these requirements are foundational of the concept of law and the other that these requirements are founded in morality. I think you can defend one without being attached to the second one. Um, so if legal orders have some normative standards that's called guiding governance, it is in terms of those standards that guiding government governance uh, that we understand the activity of legal system. Since legal system is goal-director standard, 
because this is what legal system essentially is, if I succeed achieving this goal, I succeed performing, performing the practice. The practice consists on trying to achieve that goal. So trying to produce legal system that govern actions is no different activity from trying to produce a good governance legal system, a system that could actually govern by guiding actions. Of course, persuading that aim, I can get closer or further of actually achieve, achieving the aim. However, I am ruling to achieve that aim and not other, like the governance by pure force or imposing commands. However, if the normative orders aims something else like governing by pure force, what I am persuading with this so-called like legal order is not guidance governance. It's not something, it's something else, but not a legal order. And my, my last point is related to a democracy and the concept of the rule of law that is defended. The model of Professor Power Studer is based on a, is, I have the impression that it's based on a slim concept of a rule of law and also on a slim concept of an agency. Law should preserve agency and legal system that functions well, meaning under the rule of law will be there are two slim concepts. In one is the autonomy, which is limited to the protection of a moral passive agency, and on the other, the rule of law, which is one that is limited to a, a formal criteria and a formal legal justice. Related to the agency, I have some questions. How much paternalism could be enough and how much democracy is needed? With this passive state function order, more than a democratic order, it looks to me that aims something like egalitarian agency, but not agents ruling their own self. If a benevolent governor respects the principles and the legal justice, even when I don't have a word in the rule making, even if I don't feel rules that the rules are making by me, is that enough to understand that a legal system is working well and under the rule of law. Let's remember that Fuller Rex was a king. So I would like to know which relation has this concept of the rule of law with democracy. And if a system that works well respecting all of these principles, even if it is not in a democratic system, it is a system under the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Now, um, before I turn over to Professor Paul Studer, if uh, those of you who would like to ask a question during the uh, the general Q and A while Professor Paul Studer is replying, you can just type the word "question" in the chat, and then I'll put you on the list for the Q and A. So please go ahead and responding to all of these comments. <laughs> I must confess, um, I can't. Yeah, they were. Uh, so challenging and so subtle and so many points, I simply uh, can only reply to some of those and we can come back in the Q&A. So what I take, thank, first of all, thanks both commentators a lot. It's really thought provoking and very challenging. Um, uh, to uh, to uh, um, um, First I would um, before I enter into the detailed answer, say something more general. Uh, <clears throat> when I was writing this book, I had a long, long chapter on the dispute, uh, legal positivism, natural law, constitutivism, and so on. And I had to make a cut. I couldn't include it in the book. And the reason was simply because you cannot add a legal philosophy discussion onto a book on Nazi legal theory. So I had to cut short things. And I think this is, was, is also a deficiency of the chapter I sent you. And it's a deficiency of today's talk because you, uh, both commentators raised crucial questions. What is this constitutivism? Why is it important? Why does it come in? And I, I must say this constitutive account here 
is sort it hangs in the air. And the reason is because the philosophical parts which back it are in several other papers and are not condensed here. So why constitutivism? I think the basic idea is the following. I go with heart that law is a social practice and uh, uh, a social practices are, and we find it also in Hart's concept of law, they are somehow uh, inspired by how games work and uh, uh, inspired by Royce's uh, 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 19, in the 50s, this really wonderful essay about two concepts of rules. So uh, if you have a social practice, then you have constitutive rules and you have regulative rules. Now in games like chess, constitutive and regulative come together, but in social, more complex social practices, they can get apart. And in, uh, if you consider a law as a, uh, 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 as a social practice, constituted by certain uh, uh, roles, you, uh, uh, rules, you have, uh, you need a more complex picture, right? And there have been objections here, Marmer argued this primary secondary model doesn't work and so we need a more, um, uh, we need a more complex uh, uh, account and so on. Uh, the basic idea here is if you have a social practice, then what does constitutivism add? add? Constitutivism adds that it tells you you need to distinguish between the constitutive rules that constitute the practice and those that make up the practice in regard to the regulations it means. And constitutivism tells us that social practices are tied to constitutive aims. So what, what the, pra the practice must have a point, it must to look to something. Now, and here the trouble starts now. I talk here of constitutive uh, conditions of the rule of law, and then I restrict them to very simple uh, uh, formal conditions, right? Now we know that the rule of law has a much more, has has broader ramifications. First, it's tied to a political idea. The political idea is democracy something, right? Then it can be tied to justice. And then it can be tied to very moderate conditions, which are formal conditions, which work as first restrictions within that uh, 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 social practice account. And all this I haven't worked out yet, and I have not formulated here it here. But what I when I when I I I, I worked on the Nazis, and when you read those texts, you get at some point you get uh, to a Nietzschean moment, right? You 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 get the feeling wow this can't be it, right? Let's leave morality away, right? <laughs> it's, it's just, it, 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 it makes you sick. And what I try to do with uh, interpreting those con uh, or talking of constitutive conditions of the rule of law, trying to think of law as a social practice tied to aims, some more ambitious than others, right? A, a very ambitious aim is to have it as a political ideal tied to democracy and an implementation of the substantive ideal or a substantive conception of justice. And then you come down to more moderate procedural requirements. Certain, I didn't talk today much about procedural requirements, but of course, they were all violated in the Nazi legal system. The procedure of law creation was a mere chaos, right? And you get to formal conditions of the rule of law. And uh, 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 this is the background. And uh, I'm working just on now on a paper to, 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 to get this all in order. Now to uh, uh, come back to the detail part. I think, uh, 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 George, uh, I'm really grateful for your objection that maybe uh, 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 when I insist on the separation of law and morality, 
I do injustice to some natural law positions. I tried not to because I, I made the point strong. Uh, and I also said, look, we what's valuable is what do they tell us? They tell us that we need to think morally in order to construct um, legitimate or good law, right? And I am, I'm, I'm here. I'm. I think I'm. I'm Austrian. I'm. A, I'm too much. <laughs> influenced by uh, Kelsen and legal positivism. Whenever, whenever you try to come along and say that uh, uh, bad legal systems were, are invalid, you, meet, you must specify what you mean. And you mean it in a moral sense. And I do not like those accounts it comes out also out of Fuller because he called those principles, transparency, publicity, inner morality of law. He also called them principles of legality, right? And this notion of legality now comes in and uh, uh, also, uh, uh, David Eisenhaus uses it, Dworkin in his late work moved to it, right? What is legality? What do they mean, right? And you have to ask, what do you mean? Do you mean legal validity, positive legal validity? Or do you mean something like moral validity? Le moral validity or a legal system that meets certain moral desiderata. And if you leave, mean it in the latter sense, then please talk about legitimacy and not about legality, because this uh, notion of legality, which shifts constantly between legal validity and validity in a moral sense, does no good. This really creates confusion. And here I think I would side with her. This doesn't do any good. But uh, 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 I think uh, uh, you, are, you are correct, uh, uh, George, that I have to be much more fine-grained. Just a, a little word on, on Habermas, because you say that Habermas, Alexei, and those people, uh, they insist on a conception of moral, public morality that feeds into law. Yes, and I, I agree, that's a good approach, right? It feeds into a legal system, but it's not part of the legal system. And um, um, I have a chapter on, on Habermas's uh, uh, scheme uh, in my book, uh, Autonom Leben, I think. And I have carefully construct, reconstructed their uh, uh, Habermas scheme and his conception is exactly the Kantian conception, right? You have the discourse principle, and then it, it, it branches out into the moral principle, in the democracy principle, and in the uh, Rechtsprinzip. And uh, uh, he distinguishes carefully between public autonomy and private autonomy, and morality just speaks to uh, uh, private autonomy, right? So uh, I think when uh, 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 one could not use Habermas uh, uh, to argue against my uh, uh, the position I have developed here. However, I would say all uh, about constitutivism needs to be worked out. Now, there was this point, uh, uh, George, I have to confess, I have to look at it, Abba, but I did not really understand it. The, um, it's, um, yeah. And this is a point which also was made um, by in the second commentary to talk of constitutive conditions here might not create a problem because I called it the constitutive conditions of the rule of law. But if you argue that any legal system in order, to, as you call it, charge to materialize and also, as Carlos mentioned it, if you call it constitutive, then you, you have already inserted 
something that moves away from a positivist conception of legal validity, because then you have to argue or confess that a system that doesn't meet that con uh, uh, conditions uh, cannot produce uh, uh, legally valid norms. I wouldn't go that far, but I would make the distinction and would say that they can produce, of course, positively legal, legally valid or valid in the sense of being in force, right? Those systems do have force. The Nazi system had force. Hitler's orders had force and authority, right? But it moves away so much from a uh, legal system that's constituted by rule of law conditions or close to meet them uh, uh, that we would say it's a system that has authority and force but we would not call it having uh, validity in the sense of any moral uh, permission or any moral value or something. But I agree, I need to sort that out much more carefully. Sorry, that was a long um, uh, 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 point. Uh, the last point, the connection between the rule of law and democracy, why I focus merely on those formal conditions of the rule of law, well, because I, simply also because um, democracy uh, was not, was indirectly the topic of my talk, but the uh, primary object of my talk was an authoritarian totalitarian system. And uh, 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 the connection is that a system that meets formal conditions of the rule of law can work up to a democracy, but we have to confess here uh, that also an authoritarian system that meets uh, formal conditions of the rule of law is at least better than one that violates it openly, right? Now, uh, it's true, uh, Rex is a king, it's, it's, it's a monarchy or an authority, sort of a mo mo uh, authoritarian system, it's not a fully blown uh, democracy and of course our ideal should be uh, a uh, to tie uh, the rule of law to democracy. Why? Because full, full autonomy of citizens, public and private autonomy, to use Habermas's terms, is only guaranteed in a democracy. You don't have it in another system. However, if you have an authoritarian system that at least publishes and makes public its legal norms and orders, it's already better than a system that works with uh, secrecy and terror. Thank you very much. We have now time for the general discussion.